afternoon to everyone. I'm your host for the day, Assistant Professor Mohammad Fadil Sharif. Let me welcome all of you to this international webinar on global economic development, which has a theme of impact of COVID-19 issues, challenges, and the way forward. We are over with the kind of response that we got within a span of 28 hours. We managed to have 1,220 registrations. However, since we can only host 100 participants on this platform as of now, as for the criteria uh, set of first come first serve basis, we have, have, we have admitted the first 100 participants here. We're going to host another webinar very soon, which are much, with a much greater number, and we, will be, uh, we would love to see you there again. Today we have participants from Thailand, Germany, Nigeria, Kuwait, Ukraine, United Kingdom, Oman, Fiji, Australia, and obviously our own India. Almost 56% of the attendees today are doctorate. I request all the participants to kindly turn off your web cameras during the presentation as we will uh, be having a photo session towards the end and at that time we can have your cameras on. Without any further delay, I now request our principal, Dr. Aftab Anwar Sheikh, to kindly welcome, uh, give his welcome address. And we'll start. Uh, thank you very much, Puzzle sir. A very present good afternoon to one and all. I take this opportunity to welcome the dignitaries today attending this international webinar on global economic development with the theme, Impact of COVID-19 Issues, Challenges, and the Way Forward. Organized by the Anjuman Kharu Islam's Pune College of Arts, Science, and Commerce, IQAC, Department of Commerce, PG and Research Center and Department of BBSCA. There is a strong need to organize a webinar on this topic because this pandemic has affected the whole world. We should know the issues and challenges faced in every sphere. It is very horrific around the globe and what will be the way forward. I am thankful to Honorable Dr. Rebecca Webb from Rangshit University, Bangkok, Thailand. Honorable Professor Dr. Vanida Master of Business, Japanese Administration, Thai Nichi Institute of Technology, <laughs> Bank. Honorable Dr. Hanif Lakadawala, sir, our trustee Anjuman Karu Islam, Mumbai. Honorable Dr. Manoj Kamat, sir, Principal SMCAC, Puna <laughs> Goa. <laughs> Professor Dr. Ripuranjan Sina, promoter global innovation, peace and sustainable development. <laughs> All the faculty members and respected delegates joining from all over the globe. It will definitely, this webinar will definitely expand our knowledge horizon and may give new dimensions. Friends, educational system around the world is undergoing increasing pressure to use the new information and communication technology to acquaint students with the knowledge and information they require in this techno-savvy era. To develop knowledge society, it is essential to integrate information and communication technology at all levels of education system. Hence, this webinar is a very powerful tool of education. Innovative technologies will make it possible to achieve this by providing new ways to the teachers and the students. Hence, as a teacher, it is important to meet these new challenges by continuously acquiring new knowledge and skills to discharge our duties effectively. I am very much delighted and I take pride and feel privileged to welcome one and all for this international webinar. We are indeed honored to have all of you here with us. This webinar will definitely give a direction to all and I hope there will be excellent interactions during various sessions. This would give the participants enough of encouragement and provide the audience with a rich set of divergence. I am very much thankful to you all for being with us. And once again, on behalf of YNM, Anjuman Kharulitla, Mumbai, and Pune College of Art, Science and Commerce, Department of Commerce, and Department of BPSCA, I extend a heartiest welcome to you all and hope that we will continue to have your blessings, good wishes, and wholehearted support. Thanks to all core team members to take initiative and organizing this webinar. 
थैंक्स टू फाजिल सर इमरान सर नसरीन मैडम रेशमा पाटिल एंड ऑल द कोर टीम मेंबर्स फॉर ऑर्गेनाइजिंग दिस इवेंट एट दिस मोमेंट आई विश यू ऑल एवरी सक्सेस इन अचीविंग योर डिजायर्ड एम्स थ्रू अटेंडेंस at this webinar thank you thank you very much thank you so much thank you so much sir for your kind words i now request uh, the convener and the hod of commerce department of nasrin khan to kindly throw some light on the theme of this webinar nasrin ma'am unmute hello and good afternoon covid the coronavirus covid-19 pandemic is the biggest global health crisis we have ever seen and the biggest challenge after world war 2 this pandemic is moving like a wave it is not only affecting the health but also affect stressing every country it touches this pandemic has several devastating effect on the economic social and political setup of the country This crisis has forced people to calm down, sit back, and think how to survive rather than to compete. Every day, people are losing their jobs and incomes. Government offices, schools, colleges, restaurants, malls—everything is closed. Social gatherings, meetups are cancelled. People are forced to live in quarantine by choice or by government order. Then, how the economy will survive? today's webinar on global economic development with the theme impact of covid-19 issues challenges and the way forward is a platform for all of us to have deliberate discussions and to take back food for thought and of course ideas to stay positive and economically sound in this crisis situation thank you over to you fazil All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nasreen Khan. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Nasreen Khan, for that uh, quick insight. Uh, we shall be starting with the first speaker of the day. That is Dr. Rebecca Webb. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Webb is a lecturer of English at Rangsit University in Thailand. She has a rich experience of 20 years of teaching in United States of America and Thailand. Dr. Rebecca will be speaking on the topic "Going Online: Benefits, Challenges, Impact Before and After COVID-19." Over to you, Dr. Rebecca. Good afternoon, everybody. Swadika, namaste. So I want to talk today about. Uh, I guess you could say it's an overview of what's been going on, what I've seen, what I've read in the news, and the things that it's made me think about. So I'm going to share with you a PowerPoint that I put together because I think there's a lot of visual things that we need to think about, and I have lists too, so you'll love the list. So give me just a second. Put on the share. Oh, I'm disabled. I need screen sharing. Wait, I can't share a screen. You have to let me share a screen. Nope, not letting me share a screen. <laughs> There we go. All righty. Okay, so I'm hoping you can all see. If you if you can, give me a thumbs up so that you can let me know you can see the screen. So I want to start today with a little bit of a story about my experience going online. Um, first, I have to put on my rose-colored glasses because <laughs> it all started off really kind of fun. Um, So first, when I was told I had to move my classes online, I was panicked because I had to modify all my lessons and all my assignments for an online space. I had never taught online before, but I had studied as a student online, but only two times. So it was quite a quite a shock for me. But then I was frustrated because it seemed my students did not know how to use anything except Line and Instagram. My Gen Z students knew less about computer technology than me. 
Then I became accepting and relaxed even, while I know I was working longer hours. The longer hours were okay because I wasn't driving, I slept late, I wasn't, I was having slow breakfast, I had more time with my kids, um, and it was quiet. Then I saw blue skies, less noise, cool breezes. I'm in Thailand, so that's unusual. I saw reports about cities experiencing cleaner air because there were fewer cars and trucks on the road. And I thought, gosh, this could be good for the planet and all that other stuff about access for all and education becoming equal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, I also began to see people struggling to eat, to find safe shelter, to stay home, to maintain social distancing, to find masks. My rose-colored glasses were removed. And I saw that this idyllic world where we get to stay home, plan our own days, spend more time with family, only works if your skills can be used online, if you have a home, a stable income, and can adapt quickly to the technological demands of this new world order number one, stay home. So before COVID, we had pollution, too many cars, planes, skies, planes in the skies, ships in the ocean, plastic bags and straws, garbage everywhere, too much buying and too much making and really noisy. I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody who really had a lot of time with their family and friends. Most people were eating fast street food, fast food, leftovers, and not much time for sleeping, exercising, or thinking. But my experience was after COVID, I'm sleeping more, I'm thinking more, I'm seeing flowers blooming. <laughs> and I was, wow, this is great. I love this. So what do we get? We get access, we get more free time. We don't need to transport ourselves anywhere. So we're saving resources and saving energy, yeah? So are we gonna save the planet? Maybe? We'll come back to that question. So there are challenges. Um, obviously, you know, as some of you have experienced going out onto the street helping and feed the, feed the uh, working poor who are now not working anymore, uh, you know that this is not all, you know, blue skies and roses for everybody. So there are benefits, but there are also going to be a lot of challenges as we move forward. The challenges are going to be for people and for government. Let's start with the first one. Online means being accessible and seen. So what about tracking without stalking? How do we monitor work and production, sales, delivery, without becoming Orwellian? Maybe we are Orwellian. See, this got me thinking. I started thinking about all of those futuristic apocalyptic stories, you know, like Blade Runner, Space Odyssey, 1984. And there's a problem with cameras everywhere. We're on camera right now. This is on the internet. This is going to be on YouTube. <laughs> Everyone's going to see this. I hope my makeup is okay. So, and right now, Facebook, I'm not sure if you all know this, but Facebook tracks your movements on the internet. Any website you go to, Facebook sees it and records it, and then they give you an advertisement for something that you stopped at and looked at on the internet. And you're scrolling through your Facebook newsfeed and up pops an advertisement for something that you were looking at the other day in Google Chrome. You're like, how did they know I was looking at that? So we're being tracked. So is it tracking or is it stalking? So there are other challenges too. So let's talk about a few of those. Communication. Uh, I find that people speak to me in text speak and emojis and memes all the time. I love emojis. <laughs> memes, they're getting weird. My kids like to show me memes and I'm like, I don't get it. I don't get it. Is that funny? I don't get it. I, I don't understand the memes that teenagers are, are showing and sharing. How about going viral? How many of you would like to have a video of you tripping going viral? Video conferences and meetings, sharing opinions and ideas, it's all, all out there. Copyright. Now that's another big problem. Protecting products, systems, methods, ideas. I mean, can we? I don't think we can. I actually think the idea of copyright has become 
an obsolete term. I, I don't think we can protect those things from being borrowed, stolen, used. How about jobs? Now this I think is where the real problem lies. So employment, um, I think we've, we've realized that not much has changed in let's say a thousand years. Uh, when there's a natural disaster or a pandemic, there are winners and losers. The winners are people in professions like teaching, designing, engineering, uh, management, sales, marketing, media, entertainment, the industries that do okay are education, technology, entertainment, bank and finance, logistics, manufacturing, and online retailers. The losers, are mid-level, low-skilled workers, factory, maintenance, construction, waiters, other service workers, farm workers, industries that don't do well, service, and retailers, the physical stores. So why are there winners and losers? Well, let's look at a couple of things that have happened. So I don't know if you've heard about this one. This was recently in the BBC News, a uh, question of the coronavirus pushing us toward of uh, factories operated with robots instead of people. You can have bank tellers who are robots. I mean, what's an ATM machine after all? Um, the self uh, checkout lane at your grocery store. Um, we're seeing more and more of that. So they've been talking about this for decades. I mean, I remember this from when I was working on my master's degree. There was one report recently that suggested one third of all workers would be replaced by a robot by 2030. That was before coronavirus. Now they're saying that that might speed up. One third of all workers replaced by a robot. Where do those people go? So there's another one with uh, relation to um, workers, I'm sorry, in relation to physical stores, because I said one of the losers is gonna be the physical store. So another report came out about uh, shops on High Street in London. So there are stores on High Street in London that are closing shop. They're filing bankruptcy, they're going out of business. And the reason is because they're not adapting. So the new social order number two, social distancing. What do businesses have to do in order to adapt to this new world order? Well, they're either gonna have to work out a way to be online or as some of the stores on High Street are finding, they have to adapt or redefine the space inside their store so that they can have you know, two meter separation between aisles so that nobody ever comes within two meters of each other. That's gonna be expensive. That's gonna require land. So how do small businesses navigate in this new world order where either you need to have a very large space for your shop or you need to put it all online? So now let's move to what are some other impacts? Because obviously the employment market is going to affect anybody who does not have a skill that can be translated into an online environment. So the poor. So this idea of shelter in place, quarantine, social distancing, these are easy for privileged people. Living and working online is also easy for people educated and who have privilege. We don't have global equality. So the implications of this situation uh, is gonna bring that into very sharp focus. Uh, you all know about India, you recognize this picture. This is the uh, migration out of the cities after the lockdown. You had people walking, you know, a thousand miles to their home out in the country. You had people who, uh, who had children and elderly with them as they tried to travel with no food, um, sleeping on the side of the road. Well, the United States is also having problems. We have, um, a lot of people who are poor, and I think that is often not realized. The United States has a lot of poverty. And in the United States right now, they're not being very good about health care, and they're not being very good about making sure that these poor, low-skilled working class people are getting income now that they're all forced to stay home. Uh, Amazon has been moving more and more towards robots in their warehouses. They are not showing a lot of um, concern for the health of the workers. The workers are complaining that they're being exposed to um, all kinds of things that could lead to contracting coronavirus. So 
there's a lot that we're not doing. So the world is still very unequal. And this brings me to another point. In a McKinsey report, um, this is from 2017. I think it was a 2017 report from McKinsey. They said that by 2030, there's going to be a surplus of 90 to 95 million low-skilled workers. That means there's not going to be work for those people with no skills, no training, no education. This number only accounts for 87% of the world's population. That's only 7 billion of the 8 billion. And the reason is because the study included only 70, 70 countries, which was 96% of the world GDP. Now, if you put a more realistic number to it, I think that means about a billion people are not going to be able to find work in the year 2030. Now, you combine that with the other statistic about robots taking one third of jobs away by 2030. And I think we can start to imagine a real catastrophe happening. Um, and possibly this COVID-19 thing, this pandemic, is pushing us closer to that crisis than, than we can imagine. It may be more like 2025 is when we're going to have a billion people who are in the streets starving and jobless and homeless. And possibly even the COVID is still floating around and still causing pandemics. What are we going to do then? So this all reminded me, weirdly, of a book I read when I was an undergraduate called uh, The Decameron. The Decameron was written by a man named Giovanni Boccaccio in 1348. Italy. The story is about 10 young uh, noble gentry people who lived in Florence, Italy during the epidemic of the plague in 1348. What happened in, in Europe in 1348 sounds so much like what's happening right now. And there are some passages in the Decameron where Boccaccio is describing the conditions in Florence and what people were doing. Uh, they were engaging in social distancing, in quarantining, in um, isolation, in shelter in place. They were doing all those things. They were talking about how the disease was spreading. All you had to do was touch somebody's clothes and you would get sick. And people were panicked and afraid and, and they didn't want to go out on the street. And there were two kinds of people. And it was really funny when I read this passage that described two kinds of people. We're having the same problem in the United States. You had people who followed the, the, the advice to stay home, to not go out in public, to shelter in place. Then you had the people who were the opposite and said, oh, forget it, I'm just gonna go out, I'm gonna go party, I'm gonna go drink. If I get sick, that's fine, it can't be that bad. <laughs> the same thing's been happening all over the world. You, the governments are saying, uh, social distance, wear a mask, shelter in place, stay home, don't go to work. But in every single country, there are people who are flouting these rules, who are going out in public, they're not wearing a mask, they're meeting their friends in coffee shops, they're going on the street and selling whatever product they have to sell. They're looking for work. Uh, companies are bringing people into work even when they've been asked not to. So you know, the, the descriptions of the epidemic of the plague in 1348 match almost exactly the descriptions we're seeing in the media of today's pandemic and made me wonder, has anything changed in a thousand years? <laughs> Sometimes I think maybe we haven't quite gotten where we should be a thousand years later. So I want to end on some questions. So now that we're giving some serious thought to where we go from here, some questions I think we all need to be thinking about is, will this pandemic change our lifestyle for the better and save the planet? Will these changes deliver a future that is healthy and safe for people? Will these changes bring us closer to a more equal global society? So I want to open this up to a conversation. I think all of the next presentations are going to be dealing with some of these questions in one way or another. And I think these are questions we need to be thinking about as we're listening to the next presentations. And then we can come back maybe at the end of the session and, and revisit some of these questions about 
how is this really going to change anything? Are we moving forward in a way that will improve uh, life for everybody, or is it going to be more of the same? So that's it for me. Any questions for now? Hello. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Rebecca. Are there any questions? You can please, sir, please um, chat. You can ask your questions in the chat. We are enabling the chat. If you have any questions for Rebecca, please feel free to shoot them in the chat box. Dr. Atik Sheikh, I believe, has a question. So could you please send it in the chat box? We have enabled the chat box. I'll give a, a, a minute if there's anybody who wants to ask a question. What will be newborn of the future? Sorry. And the thrust could you please specify? Oh, hang on, I'm opening. I just realized how to do chat, sorry. <laughs> 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 ah, I yeah, see chat now. I, 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 would, I would like to read it out for you, Rebecca. What is the reason that developing countries are not affected by this pandemic, your view? In wait, developing sorry, countries, which one was yeah. What is, what the, is reason? the reason? Yeah, that the developing countries are not affected by this pandemic. Oh, I think they are affected. Um, I think one of the problems that uh, many, many um, medical researchers have been talking about is the lack of testing. Many of the developing countries don't have the resources to do testing. Uh, I read a report about um, India's problem, particularly right there in Mumbai. The, uh, the slum areas of old city Mumbai are, you know, I, I can't remember what the number was, million people living in really tight enclosures where it's impossible to engage in social distancing. And um, a female uh, doctor went there and, um, she found that there was uh, a man who had gone to a local hospital to, to complain about an Ill, illness and, and, and they, they looked at him and they said, well, your symptoms are not serious. So he went home. A Couple days later, he goes back because he's feeling worse. And they say, well, your symptoms are still not serious, so just go home. A few days later, he comes back and he's quite, quite sick. And they say, well, um, you still don't have the symptoms for COVID, so just go home. Next thing, he dies at home from COVID-19. Meanwhile, surrounded by family and friends. And the, the female doctor was saying, this is not an isolated case. We have no idea how many people in these poor areas are infected with COVID, ha, have died. Um, um, I forget. Uh, Ecuador, Ecuador in South America recently stated that they had to send um, officers out to collect dead bodies, that there were dead bodies wrapped in plastic on the side of the road because there was nobody to come and take them away. These are images and stories that are identical to what happened in 1348 in Europe during the Black Plague, that countries and governments don't know how to deal with the, the numbers of people who are um, lost because of poverty, because of immigration, because of all kinds of reasons that their faces and names are not familiar to anybody. You, you look at Facebook and they talk about the people we've lost to COVID-19 and who are they? They're celebrities. <laughs> We're paying attention to the rich people. We're not paying attention to the poor. <laughs> That's the problem. True, true, very true. 
What are some uh, other Rebecca, questions? I have, yes, I have another question for you. Uh, what would be the impact of the pandemic on the education system? I think from what I've seen right here with ranks at university, I think the idea of working online is going to become more popular. I think once teachers get online and figure out how to do it in a way that is both effective for the student and not, uh, not stressful for the teacher, I think a lot of teachers are going to say, I like this because you, we all know as teachers, getting sick every term is not a big deal, is it? <laughs> Most of us <laughs> end up with a cold or flu that our student brought to the classroom. So this idea um, of social distancing is not new to us. We know we have to keep our students at a distance because they're all coming in with the flu, with the cold, with tubercula not, tuber uh, <laughs> not tuberculosis, I mean. Uh, <laughs> uh, the other one that's, that's very contagious in the United States, bronchitis, bronchitis. I've had students come into my classroom in Illinois with bronchitis and two weeks later I had bronchitis. So, you know, this is not new for us, but the idea of being able to have that physical distance from students that we don't know where they're coming from or what experiences they've had or what illness they're carrying is a really good idea. I also think that a lot of people in higher education are more uh, aware of climate change. So I think they may opt for the online because of the idea of uh, saving the planet. Uh, I think people in the audience can answer that better than me, though. Mm -hmm. Is a condition serious in Thailand? Actually, as far as our government is reporting, it's not, but they're not taking any chances. My government here is very, very cautious. They have locked down all of the major cities. They're not even letting us buy alcohol. <laughs> We've gone two months with no alcohol. It's terrible. Um, <laughs> They, they require everyone has to wear a mask when you go out in public. Stores will not let you in without a mask. So I don't think we have um, as quite a serious problem as say Ecuador has right now or Italy. Um, oddly enough, other countries that have not taken these, these precautions like Sweden are also not seeing the big numbers. Uh, Sweden recently reported that They've got a herd immunity plan. <laughs> Let everybody get sick, and then the ones who survive it will be immune to it, and we will no longer be, you know, transmitting it to people because we will have herd immunity. Other people are saying it doesn't work that way, Sweden. <laughs> so we, we don't know yet what's going to happen in Sweden, but they have not been taking any precautions. Uh, they're walking around, going to shops, uh, eating out. Um, the only people they're protecting are the elderly and the very young. So, uh, what uh, else? Okay, uh, well, we'll take one last question that we have here. Uh, what could be an alternate employment opportunity for those who are going to lose jobs by 2030? Mm. Do you think of what could be the alternative employment opportunities? I think... Um, you know, uh, Dr. Anwar was mentioning the impact on education. Uh, I think the only opportunity, the only option is adapt. And adapting will mean learning technology. They'll have to learn to translate their skill into a, into a computer or online environment. They'll have to learn to sell whatever it is they have or whatever skill they have in an online environment. I, I don't think that people in this uh, technological world are going to be able to just go apprentice with somebody in a factory and learn how to do a new stamping procedure with a machine. I think it's going to have to be uh, advanced education, uh, higher level skills, engineering, uh, computer technology, computer information systems, uh, learning a skill that can be put into a computer uh, environment. I mean, there's there's a lot people can do. You know, I've had students uh with english right they're getting an english degree and they're like oh, i don't know what to do with 
why don't you look at doing, um, you know, go into video programming or you can do uh, YouTube, YouTuber, be a YouTuber. Uh, there's a lot of things people can do, but I think they're going to have to go back to the school. Uh -huh. You should have asked Dr. Anwar right. because I think I, he I, would probably say, yeah, I think we need to work more on education. <laughs> yeah, true that. All right, uh, I think uh, you've answered uh, most of the questions. Uh, the, the moment we uh, enabled chatbot, there, uh, 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 there was a flood of questions that was coming and we had to disable the chat immediately. And, uh, <laughs> because there will be a lot of questions that will come in. Uh, the next speaker is already uh, there. And uh, thank you so much, Rebecca, for your time. And you were amazing. And you've got some really wonderful compliments. Everybody loved your session. It was super informative. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>